Uh, it's been interesting to think, uh, kind of over this pilgrimage uh, on my own, that in many instances we are reactive as a nation and as a government to the uh, atrocities of genocide. And so the question has been, you know, looming large uh, for me, uh, what could we do to be proactive? Uh, there, there was a piece of legislation uh, related to the Middle East, related to that genocide of which I spoke, uh, that was passed December 11th, uh, 2018. Many of you are familiar with it, the Iraq and Syria Genocide Relief and Accountability Act that among many things it has two major uh, pillars, two major uh, mandates or authorizations within the bill and that is to provide funding uh, for uh, criminal investigation, prosecutorial measures to hold ISIS perpetrators responsible and then also it authorizes systematic engagement and funding on the part of the U.S. government uh, for uh, humanitarian and uh, stabilization and recovery needs. It's interesting to read some of that language and I read it uh, only briefly this evening because it is relevant to our topic. Under the uh, humanitarian assistance section of the bill, um, several of the uh, federal agencies of jurisdiction are charged with the mandate that they shall seek to identify threats of persecution and other early warning indicators of genocide and crimes against humanity, etc. Certainly a mandate to be proactive <coughs> rather than reactive. And yet in the conversations that I had following upon this bill with many responsible for addressing these atrocities globally, there was a sense in which they were still thinking reactive. A good friend of mine introduced me to Laura Brayman, our guest speaker tonight. <clears throat> and I asked Laura in, uh, in an early conversation of the year, same question that I posed to different representatives within our federal agencies and within our leadership. Laura, have you ever thought about the intersection, the nexus globally between human trafficking and genocide? And immediately it was something that had resonated <coughs> with her. And, and it was a topic that she uh, had already labored over in her mind. And I thought, you know, this is a subject that, that we must address. Uh, there are others like that, that if we can begin to figure out how to address these topics, whether it's uh, you know, human migration, uh, uh, food insecurity, poverty, uh, economic drivers, uh, the vulnerability <laughs> of, of women in particular cultures, then, uh, then maybe, maybe we get out front of this issue. So uh, within that context, let me introduce our speaker tonight. Uh, Laura is a global development and child protection expert with over 15 years of experience working in Africa, Asia, Central and South America, and the Middle East. Her primary focus is on human trafficking interventions. She currently is the Senior Program Manager for World Vision, overseeing programs to address sex trafficking uh, in Guatemala, child labor in Bangladesh, female gen genital mutilation, child marriage, and other childhood education issues around the world. Previously, Laura served as a human trafficking specialist at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services within their OTIP office, Office on Trafficking in Persons. She began her career as a journalist at BBC Cambridgeshire, 
Um, she has testified before the Tom Lantos Human Rights Commission of the U.S. Congress on child protection issues. She's spoken at the University of Notre Dame on the intersection of human dignity and international development. She's well published, sought after speaker. She understands this issue. And uh, so with that, I want to turn this over to Laura. We are most honored that you're here. Thank you so much, and thank you, David, for the warm introduction, and uh, thank you to RFI for making me welcome this evening. Um, just want to check in and make sure that I have the microphone placed appropriately. So, okay, great. So my name is Laura Brayman, and um, as David mentioned, I've um, worked on human trafficking and child protection issues for most of the last 15 years. Um, I've focused much of my work on human on human trafficking um, in different parts of the globe, um, and uh, this was a really great opportunity for me to think a little more deeply about the intersection of uh, genocide and human trafficking. Uh, they're both pretty brutal acts of violence, and um, I was just talking with um, Arthur, uh, one of the one of the guests here this evening, about um, what you do in D.C. when you work on a topic that. Um, requires you to confront um, really debased human experiences on a regular basis. And Arthur was telling me that when he lived in The Hague, he would spend an hour in front of the ocean every night to kind of try to, you know, uh, get the day out of his system. And, and for me, um, a lot of what I do, I love to read. I love to go to the National Gallery of Art. And, um, and when I have to talk and think um, with some depth about issues like this, I always find that I need to... Um, tag it back to something that will help me think about the ultimate purposes of the human person and something beautiful that helps me keep going. So tonight we're gonna to talk about genocide, trafficking, and the human person as gift. And the first thing I wanna ask you is, <clears throat> have you seen Degas? I think I just knocked the clock off just a second. There we go. Have you seen Degas wax figures? You can find them in the National Gallery of Art's West Wing basement concourse, hidden in a dim, cool marble room. Arrayed in glass gazing boxes, the figures are archetypal women. Thanks to the shimmering composition of wax and clay, they seem to shine with the sweat of their labors, the muscular thrust of a dancer's arabesque or a masseuse's brusque kneading. They don't bear distinct facial features, and the intimation of eyes, noses, and lips conveys a tender kind of personalism, something private and real, the particular hidden out of regard for the holiness of an unclothed body. Perhaps because of the figure's ironic modesty, I always see their skin before I note their nudity, the deep red and brown pigment and dim glitter, its own kind of clothing, intriguing in and of itself. I first stumbled on Degas' wax figures when I was 24 years old. My early 20s teemed with accidents, some happy, some terrifying, some mundane, moments that later emerged not as chance but as serendipitous shifts in the course of a young life. Discovering Degas' wax figures was one of these moments for me. I found them the winter I returned to DC after living in Bolivia and serving with an organization that worked among people in prostitution in El Alto, the mile-high slum above the capital city of La Paz. Vaulted from El Alto's muddy brothel streets back to the striving, genteel poverty of DC young adulthood, my heart and mind worked feverishly to make sense of the human body as I had encountered it in Bolivia. Incarnated in the lives of people abused in sex trafficking, commercial sexual exploitation, and acts of prostitution that were chosen in a devastatingly abject sphere of choices. Before I went to Bolivia, I had a very limited experience of an exposure to violence. This stoked a certain innocent, empathetic tenderness about the purposes and stewardship of the human person. A tenderness that predisposed me to consider others first as friends. A heart, a mind, and a gendered body that contextualized a person but did not render them an object of sex. 
It was with this interior disposition that I encountered the over-sexualized tedium, misery, and humor of the El Alto red light district we visited. The skinny legs of teenage girls huddled and waiting in a droning brothel disco. The glazed eyes and chapped cheeks of altiplano mothers, weathered from high-altitude sun and harsh sexual encounters. And the constant parade of breasts, real and fake, a badge of pride, especially for young women who had not yet nursed children, and the red light district's most gregarious transgender woman, who had saved her money and flown all the way to Bogota to acquire a perfect pair. My own innocence was received at turns as curious, annoying, a marker of a certain kind of privilege. In that place peopled predominantly by women selling their bodies to men, I sat beside women on benches and beds and stood with them on street corners. I knew how to listen, but I struggled to know how to respond. Still, as I've written in, in other essays, I felt oddly at home in the red light district because so many of the women simply longed for female friends. To know and to be known with a sisterly affection, to laugh. And yet in this petty, lonely feminine dystopia of sexualized competition, women also longed for an understanding of the powerful and strange world of men, something beyond the violence and manipulation that they encountered every day. In my innocence, what I intuited as I watched women in this doubled quest for female and male relationships were the questions that pulse under so many shared human gazes. Who are you? Who am I? What are we meant to give each other? How will you hurt me or honor me if I offer you the gift of myself? These were the questions echoing through my mind as I returned to DC and to the East Capitol Street apartment row house that I shared with several other women, just like three blocks that way. Most of them were queued up to marry or go to grad school, and I returned to a rather precarious life as a freelance journalist. In the long, slow afternoons, I walked down the hill to the National Gallery of Art and found Degas wax figures waiting for me. I stood beside the glass gazing boxes and peered at the glistening women for what seemed like hours, examining them from all angles, imagining the tacky feel of their skin, weeping at least once in a rather overwrought manner, dragging my scarf up around my cheeks to hide my tears. I was 24. The figures captured me because they were simply women, clearly gendered and beautiful in their female forms, and so in some ways appreciable for a base sexual charge. But as they lingered in a bath or leaned easily on their hips, they inverted the feminine tedium and misery of Alalto. They were waiting, dressing, living, working, like an army of innocent eaves caught together in the happy privacy of the prelapsarian garden so fully female that the gift of their being seemed to beg and suppose the counterbalance of a waiting atom. Over the years, as I continued in a career focused largely on human trafficking, but touching too on migrations, on refugees, migration, and our century's scandalous genocides, I remember Degas' figures. My life became a typical DC boomerang experience, and when I came back to the city after overseas work, I often went to visit the women, darting down to their basement gallery for a long gaze or a quick turn just to say hello. Their, sheeps, their shapes bore so deeply into my mind that no matter where I was in the world, it was not unusual for me to think of them and mimic them when I suddenly found myself taking up their remembered gestures. Toweling off my own hip or neck, looking at the sole of my own foot, or lifting up my own long hair, I momentarily saw and felt my body as an echo of their wax bodies, and I shifted into their positions. This happened in the privacy of foreign hotel rooms or apartments, after walking the muddy paths of Bangladesh's Kutupalong refugee camp, home to perhaps thousands of Rohingya refugees who have survived genocide-driven sexual violence, or crouching under a Mozambican cashew tree to listen to the stories of child rape survivors. Violence disfigures in the act and in its resonance. After days spent working in the immediate sphere of dire sexual violence, sometimes enacted as a purely personal violation, 
other times as an attempt to assault an entire family or tribe. My imagination instinctively shifted to meditate on and even move my own body to mirror those plump, glistening beeswax women that Degas cladded to the bones of broken paintbrushes and stubby pencils. Mimicking Degas wax figures with my own body was a way of rebuking violence, of declaring in the hiddenness of my own heart, that seed of agency and freedom, those transcendent gifts that violence wants to destroy, that the human body can be held whole and entire, gendered but not exploitatively sexualized, tender and solitary and reserved as a gift that waits to choose the ones that may receive it. Because I'm primarily a practitioner, which means I'm focused on very unglamorous things like Skype calls and log frames and research and budgets, the intersection of human trafficking and genocide is generally something that I think of in those terms. I think about what funding opportunities are on the horizon, uh, what are the best practices for field-based implementation and interventions, what partners are already doing good work. But what was really great about getting ready for tonight is that it let me delve a bit deeper um, into some of the larger questions that are pulsing under these practical issues. So tonight I'd like to talk about some of the conceptual distinctions and connections between genocide, sex trafficking, and rape. And I'll propose some ideas about why we instinctively perceive sexual violence as uniquely destructive to the human person. In my discussion, I'm gonna draw on two primary examples. First, Nazi soldiers and sympathizers rape of Jewish women during the Holocaust and Islamic State sex trafficking of Yazidi women during the century's genocide against Iraq's uh, religious minorities. And finally, I'll ask, if we know that sexual violence is a grave offense against the human person, then what is it that we want to receive or be instead? As we get started, I'm going to lay out um, some definitions of terms. While sex trafficking and sexual violence can involve a range of perpetrators and victims, um, tonight I'm gonna focus my, dis my discussion on violent acts that are perpetrated by men to women. And um, one issue of ongoing discussion um, in, the, in the human rights field is the use of the terms victim or survivor. Um, and tonight, I'm going to use the term victim as opposed to the term survivor. This is in keeping with uh, UNODC and WHO um, in some of their key sexual violence materials. Uh, it's just used for the purpose of, of clarity and consistency, but in no way meant to um, obscure uh, issues of agency or empowerment. We'll define genocide um, as per the 1948 UN Convention. Um, which defines it as a specific range of acts committed with the intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnic, racial, or religious group. And the category specifies, or sorry, the, the definition specifies five different categories ranging from killing or harming members of the group to um, transferring children of the group um, to another group. Regarding human trafficking, we're gonna take the definition that's laid out in uh, the protocol to prevent, suppress, and punish trafficking in persons, which was adopted by the UN in 2000 as a protocol to the Convention Against Transnational Organized Crime. It's typically called the Palermo Protocol. It defines uh, three elements of human trafficking, the acts, the means, and the purpose. Um, the act can include a range of things, including uh, recruitment and transportation, means pivots on force, fraud, or coercion, and the purpose can entail sexual exploitation, labor exploitation, um, or other forms of violence. For sexual violence, we'll use the World Health Organization definition, uh, which basically defines sexual violence as any coercive sexual act, sexual comment, or sexual advance. A bit later, we'll need a definition of rape, and we'll also rely on the World Health Organization for this. 
Um, it defines rape as uh, physically forced or otherwise coerced penetration of sexual organs. So in looking at these definitions, we can come away with a very basic comparative analysis. Genocide targets people groups for decimation. A genocide victim bears value due to his or her affiliation with a specific nation, ethnicity, race, or religion, and this value marks the victim for an exchange of identity for death. Perpetrators keep victims alive only as a matter of course on an expedient track towards slaughter. Sex trafficking, on the other hand, targets individual victims for use in sexual exploitation. A sex trafficking victim bears a commodified sexual value that marks her for a torqued stewardship in which she's kept alive in order to facilitate an exchange of sex for gain, material or otherwise. While traffickers may find it advantageous to target specific vulnerable groups like uh, runaway and homeless youth or migrant communities, um, and while death may result um, from, uh, from the abuses sustained in trafficking, it's neither group targeting nor death that's the essential aim. Sexual violence is a more flexible foundational concept. It's applied to any act of violence perpetrated against a person's sexuality. And the goal is neither to target a group nor to realize gain, it's just simply to debase, disfigure, destroy, and a, a person's sexual capacity in particular. And in doing so, um, to destroy the particular and sacrosanct facets of uh, human agency and freedom that are nurtured um, in a particular bodily way in a person's experience of their sexuality. Human sexuality cultivates agency and freedom in a unique way because the sexual act, no matter the sexual orientations, gender identities and expressions or sex characteristics of the actors, is perhaps the most intimate gift of self that a person can make. In the nonviolent sexual act, one gives oneself to and receives another in a mutual exchange of physical and emotional generosity and receptivity. And the mutual exchange inherent in a heterosexual sex act, which I'm focusing on tonight in the discussion of sexual violence between men and women, bears the unique possibility of creating new life. Anyone who's held a tiny, warm, squalling, or sleeping infant knows the great tenderness and terror that's generally provoked in the hearts of the ones responsible for the child. And so there's something in the human heart, and perhaps especially in the heart of a woman, whose body, body radically surrenders to the miraculous and baffling inertia of creation, that knows that the sexual act naturally holds the possibilities of receiving unitive pleasure and creating new life. This elevates the stakes, and it connects sexual capacity uniquely to the interior drama of agency, the capacity to act on one's own behalf, and freedom, the capacity to discern when and how to act. Genocide's end is death. Sex trafficking and rape play a unique role in affecting genocidal decimation by attacking human sexuality, which as I noted earlier, is a primal and bodily seed of agency and freedom, Two, capac two capacities that are key to human individuation and to perseverance. And the genocidal aggressor's concept of the valence of race or religion seems key to determining what kind of sexual violence the aggressor employs. Throughout the 1920s, Hitler worked to socialize Rassenschand or race defilement which is the idea that sexual relations between Jews and non-Jews infected Germany's national ethnic body by blood poisoning. In 1935, when Germany's Jewish community numbered about 500,000 or only 0.75% of the country's total population, the Nuremberg Laws codified Rassenschand in the Law for the Protection of German Blood and Honor, which forbid extramarital intercourse between Jews German subjects, and those of related blood. While the 1930s era civil punishment stopped at prison or hard labor, a wartime Rassenschand conviction, conviction could lead to death. In truth, Rassenschand often led to death even in the years before World War II, but only for the Jewish women raped by the Nazis and not for the Nazi perpetrators. Dr. Stephen J. Katz's article, which is Thoughts on the Intersection of Rape and Rassenschand During the Holocaust, 
shows that the historic record bears ample and very disturbing evidence that the Nazis regularly killed the Jewish women that they raped in brothels, ghettos, and concentration camps. Often, they murdered rape victims in a conscious effort to dispose of the evidence of Rassenschand crimes. The Nazi drive to kill a Jewish rape victim was even stronger if the woman became pregnant from the act of rape. In Professor Katz's words, the worst possible outcome of such criminal liaisons was that the Jewish women involved would become pregnant and thereby threaten to continue the race war between the Aryans and the Jews. Pivotal to the logic of Rassenschand was the belief that Jewish blood had the capacity to taint German blood. In some ways, this complicated the Nazi narrative that the Jews were a subhuman race, as it afforded the Jews a measure of power. However, it also fortified the Nazis' drive to destroy them. Pivotal to the logic of Rassen... Oh, sorry, wrong paragraph. I already read that one. <laughs> Typically, the murder of a Jewish rape victim conceptually canceled out the rapist crime of Rassenschand because her death eliminated the possibility that she might give birth to a Jewish German child. In this way, the logic of Rassenschand, rape, and murder not only advanced the Nazis' basic genocidal aim of killing Jews, but it encouraged men to keep committing acts of sexual violence that had a unique capacity to wear down Jewish morale, assaulting both female victims and their families and communities who were often forced to witness the rapes. Here, Dr. Nama Schick's comment on sexual violence in Nazi concentration camps may be applied more broadly. As she says in Infinite Loneliness, her book of Auschwitz camp testimonies, at some point, Jewish women ceased being human women and became a wide open bodily sight that possessed signs of sex but contained no humanity, no agency to act for themselves, no freedom to choose to act, no gift to give, and no gift to receive. While the Nazi logic of Rassenschan and rape hinged on a presumed va valence of race, the logic behind the Islamic State sex trafficking of Yazidi women presumed a, presumed a valence of religion. The October 2014 edition of Dabik, the Islamic State's online propaganda magazine, published an article entitled The Revival of Slavery Before the Hour. The article declared the Islamic State's intent to target the Yazidis, a religious minority that then constituted just 1-2% to 2 of Iraq's total population. The Islamic State deemed that the Yazidis pagan devil worshippers and promoted a Sharia law argument that justified enslaving families of the infidels and taking their women as concubines. The Dabik article articulated an argument already in play at the Islamic State's August 2014 assault on Sinjar City and a series of small Yazidi villages. Nadia Murad's memoir, The Lost Girl, which many of you have probably read, is a clear-eyed account of what happened to her and other Yazidi women who experienced enslavement under the Islamic State. Kidnapped from their ancestral homes, old women and young women were generally separated into two groups. The older women were immediately massacred, while the young women were transported to their first stop on the Islamic State slave market circuit. But before they could be trafficked for forced marriage among Islamic State fighters, the young women endured the indignity of forcible conversion to Islam. The Nazi logic of Rassenschand and rape canceled out the presumed power of Jewish, Jewish blood, but the Islamic State logic of forced religious conversion and sex trafficking managed to cancel out both Yazidi women's religious identities and it managed to also codify their bodies. As detailed in Nadia's book and other testimonies, young Yazidi women were kept alive in order to ex facilitate the exchange of sex for gain, both the financial gain realized in the slave markets and the perverse morale gain the Islamic State men realized in the sexual abuse of women who, despite conversion to Islam, wore a pagan stain. Tragically, Islamic State theology also reinforced Yazidi beliefs regarding bloodlines and ethnic identity. Traditional Yazidi religion holds that women who engage in sex with non-Yazidis, whether consensual or forced sex, 
may be expelled from the Yazidi community. And only a child of two Yazidi parents can claim Yazidi parentage. As is well known within the international community, Baba Sheikh, a prominent member of the uh, Yazidi Supreme Council, declared in 2014 that Islamic State sex trafficking survivors could return to the community rather than face exile. But as recently as May 2019, he reaffirmed that traditional Yazidi bloodline rules still hold for children born to Islamic State fathers, and that the children must be left behind if their mothers wish to be welcomed back into Yazidi communities. Under these terms, many Yazidi survivors of sex trafficking find themselves in doubly circumscribed spheres of agency and freedom, restricted first by their traffickers' brutal abuse, and again by the culture they long to honor. It's one thing to piece together a logical argument about violence, decimation, and prolonged torture. It's another to pick oneself up and go about one's day, resolved to live and to try to understand how human beings in general and the human sexual capacity in specific can hold such grave scope for both death and life. In the end, we want to live. We want to give ourselves to others and we want to be received for our sexual capacity, certainly, but also for the other gifts we harbor in our minds, hearts, wills, and imaginations. And when it comes to the enmity between men and women, the drama animating the creation stories of many of the world's faiths and myths, including the Jewish and Yazidi creation myths, we want to believe that there is a way to heal, to experience the union between men and women, not as a site of struggle, destruction, and death, but as a wellspring of life. In my love for Degas' wax figures, it took me a few years to venture beyond their room in the National Gallery of Art and see the other works in the main sculpture hall. When I did, I found a parade of imposing Rodin figures. Even when he presents female forms, Rodin's sculptures always strike me as trending toward the classically masculine, with the basic musculature of the human body expanded and broadened. This holds so true for my eye that the first time I stood before Rodin's Hand of God, which is the sculpture that you see here, I mistook the broad-shouldered Eve, uh, Eve figure for Adam. Then, in slowly circling its glass gazing box, I saw the classical distinctions in their physiques, and I realized that of the two bodies bound in a primal kiss, it was a woman flying first from God's hand, and a man crowning in the curve of her stomach and breasts, as if, in emerging from chaos, his first place of rest was the womb from which all other humans would spring. There is something in the body that compels us to conquer, to take up our agency, our capacity to act as a weapon, to make sense of human weakness by denying it in ourselves or obliterating it in other people. And there's something in the body that invites us to make of our freedom, our capacity to discern when and how to act, a governor of that violent impulse, a steward that acknowledges the wages of disfigurement and asks us instead to consent to the entrustment of the gift. Thank you very much. And then, do we take questions now? Yeah. Okay. We just ask you to stand sure. at the microphone. Yeah. We'd like to open this up for questions um, to, to any one of you on the topic tonight. And I already told Arthur that if anyone asks me a really hard genocide question, he's going to get it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's oh, beautifully done. Thank you for this. I, I think you're a young um, Nicholas Kristof from a religious um, and faith-based perspective, so I just really want to thank you for that really stirring uh, perspective. But I wanted to ask you, what's the Yazidis' um, uh, response generally uh, to the, this, this um, edict? And how are the women trying to um, um, change that 
if at all? My understanding is that um, individual families have have dis they have for, they have turned against the edict and they have received their daughters and their grandchildren, but there are others who have not and who will not. Um, you know, who feel that it's really too much of a too much of an offense to welcome the child of an Islamic State actor who may have murdered um, other Yazidi women, men, or children um, into their home. There are a series of orphanages um, in Syria and in northern Iraq where women will often leave their children um, if they choose to go home. And there are some very heartbreaking accounts um, that, you know, that, that are available in the public record, you know, of um, not only the women relinquishing their children, but also of the children, uh, you know, dealing with the loss of their mothers and the, the, the experience of abandonment at the, at the institution. Um, and there are, there's a strong network of international and, and local um, actors who are really doing their best to provide um, family-based and institutional care to the children. Mm -hmm. There are, a, yeah, there are a couple of smaller organizations. Um, uh, some receive backing from um, Western and American funders, and some are local. Um, but it's, it's kind of a combination. Yeah. Yes. Um, I work with an organization called Youth for Human Rights International, and this is quite insightful for me because a lot of what I do is I work with youth and educating them on different elements of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, so human trafficking being one of them. And one of the things that I thought was quite interesting about your presentation was this element if you have these women who in the Yazidi community will not be accepted back into the community. And I wonder if that element of human rights education in those communities would help bring about that acceptance or what role you feel education of these basic human rights to one, you know, possibly prevent this kind of discrimination and abuse from occurring. Both from this discrimination standpoint of you're now tainted, you're now ruined, as well as, you know, how can we help stop that kind of trafficking, that kind of abuse in the first place and how you feel education might play a role in that in local communities. That's a really great question. I mean, because the, the, the challenge is that it's the Yazidi Supreme Council that's made the declaration. And, um, and it's based on uh, their very strong, enduring reliefs regarding bloodlines. It's even based on their creation story. And in their creation story, uh, I, I apologize, I will probably mispronounce it. It's the angel. Does, does anyone know how to say the angel's name correctly? Tawisi Malek, I think. Um, comes to earth and um, Adam and Eve are created and then the first humans are actually not created by Adam and Eve coupling but by Adam and Eve having a competition about um, whose whose seed will will create the human being and um, they they put the seeds in different jars and um, and Adams opens his and there's a human being and Eve open her opens hers and I think it's in the accounts that I read, it's it's vermin or something like that. I know it's kind of kind of dramatic, uh, but so it's um, that um, that human that w that came out of the jar that held Adam seed that that is um, the first Yazidi, and so their their bloodline theology goes back that far. Like it has that deep of a root. Like their concept of the entire universe and the creation of the human person pivots on this understanding. And so I think it's maybe less a matter of education and um, more a matter of, um, you know, the, the communities themselves grappling with um, with the practical implications of, of the theology. Does it really hold? Does it really serve? You know, it was a big deal in 2014 when Baba Sheikh made the proclamation stating that um, women who had been um, enslaved by by the Islamic State were welcome back into the community. That was, as far as I understand, um, you know, fairly unprecedented. And so it seems to me that it's not, it, it would not be unusual for this group of people to look, you know, with compassion on on uh, the women and perhaps even the children who um, who've who've suffered from uh, from these terrible acts of violence, but um, but it's it seems that that the bloodline, the theological bloodline issue, which is something 
really that their religious leaders have to work out holds. And and it's really individual families at this point who are working out the the implementation of that. So perhaps if you work with the if the with the individual families, you could have some success in at least um, triggering a a compassionate response for children who have no fault of their own are barred from entrance into the community. That's a great question. Thank you. Yes. Um, so in listening to you speak tonight, and just in general, my very general reference on these issues, we focus a lot on what we perceive as the victim, which is the person who the violence is done to. And I'm just curious in your experience and your work, if there's anything that you've come across where there's been an intentional, and it, and it doesn't sound compassionate to say it, but an intentional focus on perpetrators and what it would take to, as the perpetrators of violence, in a way, they are not an innocent victim, but a victim in another way. I don't know if that, I'm probably not phrasing that right. Um, but has there been any sort of interventions that, that you've ever heard of that have attempted to address this issue from a perpetrator standpoint, and I don't even know what that looks like. I'm just, I'm just curious. If that is a really great question, and I think it's especially important because often people who are the perpetrators have experienced some kind of abuse or violence themselves. So they're visiting that violence onto a, a vulnerable victim who's within their sphere of action and influence. Um, internationally. Um, the work that some of the grassroots work I've seen with dealing with perpetrators and um, in um, with an eye toward their healing, you know, in part simply to stop a repetition of crime, but also out of a out of a um, compassion for them as human beings, has happened in rural Mozambique, um, where um, communities are fairly isolated. They're very tribal, and um, the stakes are high, you know. People, everybody knows everybody else, and um, and in and in some some of the long term um, child protection intervention work that um, that I've supported in that region, I have seen not systematic but one on one instances of people accompanying the perpetrator, and um, globally, one of the most useful instances that I found of that was a it was actually a project in Canada where um, men who had committed, at that point, I think it was majority men, but also some women who had committed sex crimes were um, uh, essentially accompanied by a group of, I want to say, between five and ten people from the community um, who represented a range of um, actors. I think that the intervention might have been um, spearheaded by the Quaker community. I hope I'm not misspeaking. Um, but it was it was one of the only things that I've seen that really works to get at the the root causes of violence in the heart of the perpetrator and to deal with, as mentioned earlier, the fact that the perpetrator likely experienced sexual violence, um, physical violence, him or herself. So, thanks. Yes. Uh, your your presentation uh, focused a lot on, and it's ultimately about the human person, about seeing the human person, seeing someone as human, having having uh, inherent worth and dignity. Uh, and in a place like Washington, I think especially for people that work in the areas of, of law and policy and politics, uh, it can be very easy to sort of forget about the human person and what can sometimes be somewhat abstract, uh, abstract conversations. and. I think it's it's partially because there's there's a dehumanizing aspect to the way we work now. Work, modern work, especially this kind of work, is so reactive, um, particularly with the volume of email and texts and everything else. And it's very hard for people to have time to think, to really stop and pause and think about things. Can you maybe say a little bit more rooted in your own experience about what you've done and what you've observed? Uh, one, to take the time to think. Two, to take the time for things like beauty, you know, art and music and culture and this sort of thing. Um, and then thirdly, you had mentioned um, the, the women um, in Bolivia uh, and the desire for friendship and the role of friendship 
um, for you and for others you've, you've been around in really helping you stay focused on, on the human person in the work that you do and in your life and abroad? That is a great question, and it is one of those DC questions with three parts. So, <laughs> so I'll try to take each one. Um, Nathaniel was asking about uh, what do you do to make time, what, did, what can people do to make time to think, to make time for beauty, and to make time for friendship? And um, I think maybe this sounds really basic, but I think the first thing is sleeping and eating. <laughs> you know, like if you if you do those things for yourself, then you have really fundamentally acknowledged that you have a body and that you are human. And um, especially with uh, commuting, sometimes it can feel very difficult to feed yourself and go to bed on time. <laughs> or, or, or if you don't, um, you know, if, you, if most of your friends live scattered across the city or if you have a, a lot of evening commitments for, you know, professional networking or even for, you know, very fruitful commitments, you know, like a, some kind of a creative endeavor that meets, you know, once a week or something. Um, sometimes it can be hard just to eat and sleep. So... I think eating and sleeping is like first good step. I can't say that I've mastered that, but <laughs> and I think, you know, the more you get yourself on a rhythm of eating and sleeping, the more um, your mind kind of calms down. It's like with a little child, you know, when, when you when you give them some some basic rhythms for their body, you can they they stop being so sassy, you know, <laughs> and, um, and then for beauty, I think it's um, important to find a creative outlet that is very nurturing. Um, whether that is, um, like I, one of my housemates loves to do brush lettering. I had never done that before. And one night I sat and brush lettered with her and it was incredibly relaxing. I loved it. Now I understand why once every two weeks she sits down and does brush lettering. It was great. Um, I, I like to make time to read and write. Um, I have, uh, other friends who really love in plain air painting, you know, so they'll try to like go out to someplace beautiful and put up an easel and and do that I have another friend who um takes ballet classes so you know once you've calmed down your body so that it's not so sassy then maybe you've got a little more brain space to think about what actually makes you happy and to try it and um and I think that um uh, having friends is really important especially in a city where um we really do kind of treat each other like commodities, you know, like who's going to do what for me? Who's going to help me get my next job? Who's going to help me get this thing on the hill? Who's going to help me blah, 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 you know? <laughs> and so f finding the people that, that you know are human and um, who actually want to like sit down and have dinner with you. And that can be really hard. Like what if that person lives like a 45 minute train right away? And like, you know, and, you, and you, so just even learning, like, are there, are there people in your life who actually want to be committed to friendship? You know, and sometimes you can find those people individually or in groups. And um, then making that commitment myself sometimes has been the hardest thing. Like just making myself do it um, so that like over time I finally begin to receive the accumulated fruits of making that commitment to that person or those people. So I think I answered your three. How to make time to think, how to make time for beauty, how to make time for friendship. Um, can you talk a bit about ways that the global community, both at a local scale and to foreign governments maybe, can uh, take part in intervention efforts for human trafficking? Well, you know, over the last 20 years, um, the legal instruments have gotten better. Um, so just greater adoption of, um, of human trafficking laws and, and then the... Um, the challenge from that point forward is actually applying the laws um, and um, just shoring up the essential capacity of rule of law in a country so that, you know, if somebody tries to press the human trafficking lever, like the whole system actually works, you know, or someone wants to tries to press like the rape lever or the fraud lever or whatever, then the whole thing lights up and moves and does what it should. Um, so rule of law is important. Um, I, I just continue, uh, you know, I continue to believe after, you know, 15 years of addressing these issues that there is nothing like the family to protect a child, um, especially when I was living and working in Ghana. Um, uh, I was with a small family foundation that um, helped uh, remove children from child labor on Lake Volta and then um, 
tried to do some good high quality institutional care um, themselves and through a network of partners. And um, every single child um, that I worked with um, was either an orphan or their parents had migrated for work or they were the um, the the child of a of a sexual some kind of sexual violence or they were the child of a a second a first wife and the second wife had come on the scene and didn't want the child of the first marriage um, or um, there was some kind of horrible violence in the family and and the child had been taken in by an aunt or uncle and essentially used as household help until someone removed the child. So my, I often say to people, if mothers and fathers were able to love the children they created, they, I would not have a job. And that really wouldn't be a problem for me. Mm -hmm. So, so two thoughts. Yeah. And then just to follow that up, since we are in DC and the political arena in general, do you have any thoughts on what politicians can focus on in addressing? Mm, that's a really good question. Um, I do, I hope this isn't too controversial for this um, audience, but I do tend toward um, the Nordic law, which um, decriminalizes um, the people who are selling sex and criminalizes the act of purchasing sex. I think that shifts the, um, the responsibility a bit more equitably. You know, um, you know through the years um, in various spheres, I've worked alongside um, women who were... Uh, either trafficked as children or um, found themselves in sex trafficking after a, a childhood and adolescence that was rife with sexual abuse and sexual assault and um, and uh, with you know a great respect for the agency and freedom of the human person I I I do think that it's rare for someone to choose to have violence visited on them on a regular basis and um, and I, th I think it's. I think if laws can shift so that um, so the person who purchases is bears the responsibility um, in a legal manner, that it's a fair situation. Yes. You mentioned the importance of rule of law to helping cut back against many of these things. Mm -hmm. What do you see as sort of the probability that there will be some sort of legal accountability, uh, especially as regards Syria? Obviously, mm -hmm. these are very difficult legal issues, and we're looking at a long process. Yeah. But is there any sort of probability that there will be any legal accountability? Oh, down? my goodness. That is a great question. If anyone else in the room is an expert on this question, I am happy to cede the mic. I mean, you know, just I have I don't typically work on um, conflict situations. Um, but, I mean, my sense is that it takes quite a while for a country to stabilize and gestate to the point that it can have like even a bare bones legal system but it looks like maybe someone else wants to take this question so i'm gonna i'm gonna pass it off go right ahead the smiling david uh, referenced the law earlier and it was something that i actually had a chance to uh, to, to work on um, congressional staff um, i mean i think the first answer part of the question is supporting um, as david noted earlier the gathering of evidence and the preservation of evidence against perpetrators. Um, one of the <coughs> governments have historically funded um, what we call human rights documentation, so which basically just sort of tells you sort of generally what happens, which is very important in terms of informing uh, policymakers in real time. But it doesn't necessarily uh, connect a specific criminal act against a specific victim to a specific perpetrator. And it's largely not usable in criminal trials. There are exceptions to that, but that's, that's, that's often the case. And so I think right now, there's a real priority in conflicts like Syria, uh, and even um, you know, what's been done to you mentioned Rohingya in Burma, of gathering that evidence right now, uh, preserving it, preserving the chain of evidence, uh, preparing things for use in trials, not knowing where those trials may take place, whether it's going to be in a domestic court somewhere, whether it's going to be in some sort of internationalized setting. Um, so at least one part of the answer is really prioritizing the, uh, the evidence collection, because over time, people's memories fade, evidence gets destroyed, evidence gets lost. And, uh, and then, you know, I guess the other thing would be, um, you know, governments like ours and some Europeans and others in their databases, they have information, they have lists of people who are suspected terrorists. And their databases also need to be populated with the names of people that are suspected 
uh, perpetrators of atrocity crimes, whether it's sexual violence or, uh, or something else. So that if they try and travel to Europe or the United States or wherever else, or apply for a visa or show up in an airport, there's a hit. And they can be, uh, they can potentially be arrested and, and prosecuted. And the United States, like a lot of European countries, actually has in the law the basis for prosecuting people who commit these kind of crimes overseas and then physically come to the United States. If they don't, if it does, doesn't have to be done in some sort of international setting, we can actually prosecute them. And to add a prosecutor's yeah. perspective to that, first just to echo what Nathaniel said about um, about the importance of evidence collection and link it a little bit to what Laura you were talking about with rule of law because whatever organization you're is collecting the evidence, whether it's the domestic government or something else, you have to have systems to store that evidence. You want physical evidence ideally, particularly if some of your victims are homicide victims as well as or as opposed to sexual violence victims, that's really important. But you have to store it in a way that it preserves a chain of custody, that it's going to be accessible in court. You have to have the forensic pathologists out there. And you're going to be collecting in some of these cases where it's mass violence, like in Syria or what was done to the Yazidis in Iraq. Millions and millions and millions of pieces of evidence. All of which interrelate, potentially, in cases against higher level suspected perpetrators, people in positions of authority, like the folks who run or ordered other people to run the online market for Yazidi women as opposed to people who were involved in, say, just the purchase uh, on one end or another of one individual survivor. Um, and all of that evidence, because it interrelates, it can support or it can create problems for other evidence. And you've got to have an IT infrastructure that quick allows you to quickly and reliably make those assessments in a way that we would find acceptable in a criminal trial in our own jurisdiction. And finally, you've got to be able to provide support and protection in many of these areas to the people who have the courage to come forward and to tell you their stories. And you have to have people who are trained to ask them questions in the right way that's going to, because they're going to be reliving at your request some of the worst moments of their lives. And you've got to be prepping your investigators in a way that honors that courage that they're showing by making sure you're doing what you need to do to put them in a position to get justice if they, uh, if they have the courage to talk about it. I think I just, just wanted to point, I think especially in a case where you have a group like ISIS, um, often what happens in these situations is they'll be, you'll have a perpetrator who's prosecuted for um, committing acts of terrorism or material support for terrorism. Um, but the sort of law enforcement structure is sort of set up either culturally and institutionally somewhat, so they're just looked at as a perpetrator of terrorism. And there has to be um, both in law, but also in the way that um, agencies work together, whether it's the intelligence community or law enforcement agencies, so that you're able to have, you know, there has to be sort of a certain sequence of things, but you're able to prosecute somebody for both. Ideally, you prosecute them for both. Now, there may be a situation in which, you know, we have the strongest evidence is on terrorism charges, and the evidence when it comes to atrocity crimes we're just not convinced that they hold up and they may decide not to prosecute them. Maybe it's the other way around, but ideally, you're prosecuting them for both. Thank you. Is there anybody else who has anything to add for that? Okay. Thanks, guys. I would add only to the final point of the conversation that, you know, part of the reason that we focus uh, this series on young professionals is because you really are the policy makers of today. I mean, you're the policy influencers. And the things that we're talking about, particularly in the questions, you know, are areas of policy that need work. And so here we are in 2019, you know, five years after 
uh, the ISIS atrocities perpetrated in 2014. We, we, we suffer severely over inefficient collection of evidence. Um, you know, when Nathaniel was talking about, uh, you know, in terms of prosecuting for multiple crimes, I'm not aware of one instance where that's happened in five years in Iraq. So these are areas of engagement in your sphere of influence that you can help influence those who are making policy here in Washington. And that's, that's really the, the reason for tonight's event. So uh, with that, let me thank you again for being here, Laura. Thank you for, uh, well, for, for, for teaching us about more about the intrinsic uh, worthiness of the human person. Thank you. Let me, uh, let me do a couple matters of house cleaning uh, here at the end. Um, one thing, I want to mention an event that's coming up in January. If you're here tonight and you're an undergraduate student, or many of you have a network of undergraduate students that you work with, interns, freshmen, all the way to seniors. We are holding in conjunction and collaboration with the Museum of the Bible in January, January 15th through 17th, a seminar called Statesmanship and Religious Freedom. The applications are being taken on our homepage, on our website, uh, as we speak tonight. And we'll be uh, bringing 30 college students from across the United States into Washington. Their only expense is travel, round trip, round trip travel to and from Washington. Once they get here, all expenses are paid. So their lodging, their food, the seminar, the seminar will be led by uh, Tim and Becky Shaw in the morning. Uh, we'll have David Little, former professor at Harvard Divinity School, also out of the Berkeley Center for Religious Freedom, who will be a keynote speaker. Um, we'll have members of Congress that uh, will be meeting with the students. They'll be traveling in the afternoons off to uh, locations within Washington, the Holocaust Museum, uh, USAID, uh, the World Bank, meeting with other leaders, policymakers in Washington on religious freedom. So within your network, if you know students who would benefit from this, uh, please send them to our home website. Let me also say that we are not just about being serious, we're about having fun. And so here at these speaker events, we, uh, we hold a raffle. Y'all didn't know that you signed up for a raffle when you came in. In fact, I didn't know this until the second speaker series. <laughs> so, but uh, the winner of tonight's raffle is... Danielle Gray. Are you thank you. We have another potential winner. <laughs> Let me just tell you what the gift is. You may get more excited. It's a $25 a gift card at the Calabash Tea Bar and Cafe. So, do we have another we have name? The second winner is us, Suzanne Beecher here. Yay! Yay. <laughs> Suzanne, there you go. Thank, Thank you. you. And there is an event happening. I don't have the brochure. What's the date? Sure. So it's uh, there's an event that will be in our office on November 20th um, with a prominent uh, Jewish scholar and author, Jonathan Fox, um, on his latest book, uh, talking about discrimination against religious minorities. So mm -hmm. you're all welcome to attend. We have some flyers on this table over here, as well as flyers for the uh, seminar program that David was talking about. We'll pick this back up in the spring. Uh, make this, you know, a regular stop along the way when you can as we continue to grow the speaker uh, series. Uh, we're blessed tonight with Laura, but we'll be having other notable speakers on very relevant topics uh, coming into the spring. So watch for that. Please engage on tonight's subject. It's, uh, it's important. Uh, we want to shift the conversation from being reactive to proactive. 
we want to examine this topic of global se uh, genocide from the standpoint of looking at precursors to genocide. And then once that genocide happens and leaves us with a, uh, a set of vulnerabilities, if we don't address those vulnerabilities, they turn into precursors for simply a cycle of genocide again. So please engage on that. Thank you for coming tonight. Hang around a few extra minutes. There's some more food and beverages out here and uh, just share some fellowship with those that came tonight. Thank you very much.